Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Global Justice Forum. I am Robert Lee of Leif Cabraser, Hyman, and Bernstein. We're a law firm in San Francisco, New York, and Nashville. This is, I believe, the seventh Global Justice Forum. This is the fourth time we've met in New York. Before that, we had meetings in London, Paris, and Rome. Today, we expect, uh, we expect 200 people. You people are here early, but we're expecting uh, many more, and some students today, too. I believe we have attendees from 22 different countries and students from, I understand, 15 countries. This year, the forum is different in that we're joint venturing it with the Richmond Center. The Richmond Center was a creation of Richard Paul Richmond, who, through his generosity, created a center between the law school and the business school. Richard, who is not here, unfortunately, today, uh, and I are both graduates of, of both those schools. There are now, I think, 500 graduates during the last 50 years. Before I forget, I want to thank the sponsors. There's Garden City Group, Leaf Cabraser, Russ Consulting, Kinsella Media, and City Private Bank. These sponsors have been with us for the past several years. And it is through their generosity that we are able to provide this forum free to attendees. I want to thank Dean Schizer, who will join us at lunch in Columbia Law School for providing this venue, which works out so well for all of us. At this point, I want to introduce the co-directors of the Richmond Center, Jeffrey Gordon on my left, who is the Richard Paul Richmond Professor of Law at the Law School, and there's Chris, Chris Mayer from the Business School. He's the Paul Milstein Professor of Real Estate at the Business School. And at this point, I think, um, Chris is going to take over. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Bob. Um, and I have to say, it has been an enormous pleasure for um, us at the at the uh, Richmond Center and for me personally to be working um, with you on this event and actually on you know other other things that the center has been doing. You've been a big supporter uh, for us, for Columbia, for Columbia Law School, and you know we're really grateful for your support, and I would say more broadly, it's just been really a pleasure sitting down and, uh, and talking and working together. Drinking the wine. <laughs> and drinking the wine, of course. Um, so, wanted to thank you very much for, uh, for your support. Um, and this is, from the uh, Richmond Center's perspective, this is really part of our broader mission as a center, which is to bring together people from the business and law communities to take on topics that are relevant to folks that are sitting on both sides. I think in a sense, some of you coming from the from the legal side and most of the folks here are going to be um, our lawyers or law students, the, you know, you often sort of, there's kind of very much kind of a silo perspective and if you think in your work things are a bit siloed between kind of the legal side and the business side, in academia, silos are much um, more impenetrable. Uh, maybe we should think of them as fortresses as opposed to silos. People kind of work in their own areas, schools work together, and there are not a lot of opportunities for people to communicate and collaborate. And one of our missions as a center is really to try and break down those barriers and to try and have people who are working together across these areas because you really, you know, in the, in the same sense that you can think about the best business ideas in the world, but if you don't understand how to structure, um, how to structure those and operate in the current environment, current regulatory um, and legal environment, you're not going to be very successful. I think on the law side, there's also been a lot of pressure to move from kind of the 40,000 foot level back to really implementing things and a lot of pressure on law schools to think about these issues and mm -hmm. Dean Schizer has been an enormous supporter of our center and you know as a co-director as well as the idea of really very practical implementation of some of the uh, ideas that are uh, that are presented in the law school. So for us it's been you know a really good opportunity to work on this. I have to say that you know joining the Global Justice Forum in its uh, seventh uh, 
Um, as the seventh uh, presentation of the forum is really exciting, and this is a great franchise that, uh, that you've uh, built up, and we're very grateful for our sponsors and for all of you for coming, and I think we'll see kind of people uh, continuing to filter it. So um, thanks a lot. On that note, we're going to, I'm actually um, evolving right into the first panel, and the panel we're going to talk about, we're going to start with um, an issue of securitization and mortgage-backed securities. And this is an area that I've been um, personally involved with for a number of years in my own work, having um, written policy proposals to try and deal with some of the problems associated with these securitizations. And I think you probably read in the paper ad nauseum about um, sort of the kinds of problems that have come up, the idea of people originating loans, you know, so-called liar loans, um, the idea that people were sort of originating loans to folks who they knew had no ability to pay for um, the properties. And I think in, on my end, a lot of the work I've done has been sort of trying to get inside these securitizations once they were established to try and think about how could we possibly get out of the mess. And I'm always struck by some of the, you know, some of the earlier work that Tomek Piskorski has, which shows that within the securitizations, for example, they had about 30% more foreclosures than banks that were managing their own properties. And it was really a function of the incentives that were built into these um, structures and the incentives that really suggested that in fact, servicers were earning fees as opposed to taking losses on their books. And as a result of that, we ended up in a circumstance where, um, and I think Bill will talk to some of these things in a little bit, it would have been both in the interests of investors and homeowners to have had fewer foreclosures because investors would have been paid more money, homeowners would have been able to live in their homes, and those two things would have left both groups better off, but given the structure of the securitizations, instead we ended up with a system where we kicked out many more people out of their homes than really um, needed to be the case. That actually is not the topic of our, uh, of our panel today, um, although it relates to it. Um, the topic of the panel really has to do with what had been the implications of the securitizations that got built. Um, how did we end up with so many problem loans inside these securitizations? Did investors understand what they were buying and just ignore the problem? Um, or was there not enough information given about these things? And, you know, to some sense, you, you start to read headlines, this bank is paying 800 million, this settlement is, you know, $8 billion, and you sort of look at numbers, the legal settlement with the, uh, with the government, was, what's the price on it, 20, uh, $23 billion, I think? 25 was the nominal price. These seem like big numbers um, until you recognize, and Tomac's gonna give us some data in a little bit, he's gone through the securitizations and found by two easy measures, you have $160 billion of badly originated loans. And so when you add up all the numbers together, the numbers seem really small in a sense, given what essentially blew up our financial system and really the global um, financial system. So we're gonna talk about those issues today. We're gonna talk about sort of start with what the data is on some of the um, looking through the securitizations and Tomek's uh, going to talk about that. And then we're going to get a variety of perspectives. We have a, um, a person who I think has been a representative of the investor side of this, Bill Fry, who's been very outspoken and has been involved in substantial amounts of litigation associated with these securitizations, although I think he'll tell you he personally got out of um, investing in most of these things well before the kind of worst of these, uh, these started. And then we have um, uh, Alan Farrell and Jeff Gordon from Harvard Law School and Columbia Law School to give a to give their perspective on the legal issues involved in terms of what the liabilities are, how do you think about the damages, were there damages, who was harmed, and we will then finish up the panel talking about how these issues play 
towards the future of credit markets, which is how do we bring back a private um, a private label mortgage market and securitization system when investors have lost, you know, really hundreds of billions of dollars associated with the kinds of investments they made before. How do these legal issues play to the public policy issues that you really read in the paper, which is now the government is doing 90 plus percent of all mortgages in this country. How do we bring back private capital? So that's what we like. So we're going to start with uh, the economist and the data. So uh, my colleague at Columbia Business School, Tomek Kaczorski, will uh, will start us off. So thank you very much. It's it's my pleasure uh, to be here, and thanks to Chris and and, and uh, the people from Richmond Center for setting this great panel. Uh, I come here from the academic perspective, so I'm not taking sides and not on either side of the trade, on, on the defense side, or on the accusation side. I just want to present you an academic perspective and show you something like what we think as academics is in the data. So most of what I'm going to talk about is based on my paper with uh, the two of my colleagues. One is Amit Sero, who is professor at Chicago Booth. Another is James Whitkin, who is a research assistant and um, a graduate student of, uh, at Columbia Business School. <laughs> Anyway, maybe let me let me talk a bit, uh, uh, just to not waste our time. So let me first tell you what we are trying to do. So uh, first of all, the, the main question of our paper is try to see to what extent the existing market arrangements in the market ensure truthful disclosure of asset quality. Uh, why this question interests us? You know, for the market to function, some very basic level, the buyers and sellers need to understand what is being transacted. At least need to understand certain basic characteristics of the asset, and such disclosure really importantly affects efficiency of the market. So for example, if buyers are misinformed about what they are buying, you can result in misallocation of scarce capital in economy. For example, we might end up financing too much of uh, real estate uh, uh, prior to the crisis just because buyers think it has better quality than it actually is. And of course, once the investors realize that there are problems of misreporting quality of assets, you can result in a typical kind of acker of breakdown of trade. Once you know you have some lemons in the marketplace, investors might not be willing to, to invest. And remember, residential mortgage-backed security market essentially shut down on the private side. So what is the existing approach to this question? There are, there are a number of anecdotes we have in terms of this disclosure. Uh, and there is a number of academic studies, but most what academics did so far is to look on ex post performance of assets and try to infer something from that about uh, uh, the choices made by the banks, by the borrowers, by the, by the brokers, and so on. So here we take a very different new approach, and we really want to directly identify instances of misrepresentation in these mortgage-backed securities. So it's not just about asymmetric information. We want to focus on the cases in which literally the buyers of these securities were given false information regarding what they are buying. Just to give you an al analogy, suppose you want to get married, you go to the jewelry store and you buy a ring, and the seller tells you this is a 24 carat ring. We know this is a high, the highest pure, one of the highest purity. You go home, you're happy, you spend money, but a little bit later you realize, you know, your colleague maybe who is in jewelry business looks at it and says, well, this is a really 12 carat ring. You get a really piece of junk, you way overpaid for what you got. So we're trying to do something very similar in the context of financial market. We want to see what the buyers told the investors they were getting and actually what they got. And that's why we'll focus on objectively verifiable criteria. Just a little bit background for those of you who are not very familiar with the residential mortgage-backed security market. We'll be talking mostly here about non-agency residential mortgage-backed security market, which is currently virtually shut down in terms of new originations. At its peak in 2007, there were about two more than $2 trillion of securities outstanding. The process is fairly kind of, by now, well known, you know, the, how the process works. Originators issue a number of loans, and issuers and underwriters create a pool of loans, which is usually uh, bankruptcy remote. They tranche securities depending on the various risk and sell them to buyers. And you know, the AAA tranches, the, this is the most of the uh, volume and usually buyers are somewhat less sophisticated in the sense that they're pension funds, mutual funds, so they very critically rely on certification of asset quality offered by rating agencies and underwriters. Underwriters are a reputable institution, well, uh, like Lehman Brothers or Bernstein, so to speak, <laughs> but they were reputable before the crisis, 
and this is very important for AAA guys. So, uh, so an important part of this market, of course, buyers need to understand what we are getting. So they are informed about this in prospectus anytime the issuance of such a pool happens. And in addition, they are giving a detailed loan files that tell them precisely, loan by loan in a pool, what are the characteristics of these mortgages. And this information is fed into rating agencies that decide what the subordination levels are and so on. And more sophisticated buyers that buy this mezzanine and equity tranches, the riskiest part of the pool, like hedge funds, at least the best one of them will use this information, feed them through the pricing models to decide really what the price of the security is. And generally, market participants understand this information is important. Also, from the legal perspective, there are contractual agreements to make sure that, uh, to some extent, underwriters, lenders, issuers are liable to what we are selling. And in principle, if you show material breaches and differences between what you are selling what you are telling investors they are getting or what they actually got, you can force repurchases of these securities. So what we are essentially doing here is we have a methodology in which we can compare what investors were told they were getting in this disclosure in prospectuses and what they actually got. The way we do it, we, we essentially have a merge of the data of this prospectus and disclosure data with a credit bureau agency that have very detailed information about each of the loan. It's kind of in real time, but during this transaction, this information was not available to investors. So essentially, by comparing what is the actual characteristic of these assets to what was disclosed to investors, we can identify the instances of misrepresentations. We really focus on two things. The first misrepresentation is the so-called misreported second liens. You know, many homes in, in, in the US were financed the acquisition with first mortgage, the big one, and a junior one, because usually borrowers don't have money for down payment, essentially speaking. And this is very important characteristic from the investor's perspective, was the overall leverage, how much overall risk or debt is on a given property. So just to give you the, the example of such misrepresentation, take a $100,000 house that was financed with $80,000 mortgage. So combined on to valuation in this case is 80%. And uh, suppose this is what investors are being taught. Investors are effectively buying this senior $80,000 loan. But suppose, in fact, the actual CLTV is 95%. In other words, the equity piece, the amount of money the borrower then pays is very tiny. Why? Because the borrower simultaneously get $80,000 loan, and in addition get $50,000 loan to finance the transaction. So investors are misled by thinking they're buying a loan when the investor then pay $20,000, so it's a fairly safe uh, mortgage, while in fact they're getting a, a loan which, which will when the investor then pay only $5,000. And the second misrepresentation we are looking, which is a little bit more fuzzy, are these instances where borrowers, the investors are told that the borrower will reside in the house or resides in the house, while in fact the borrowers, as an investor who bought house for a second home or just for speculative purposes. And both misrepresentations can adversely impact loan performance. So just quantification. How big is this problem? So on the misreported second lien side, about 7% of loans that told investors there is no second lien actually have additional leverage which substantially increases the risk of loans. If you add home equity line of credits that legally are also considered a second lien, this number goes up to almost 14%. And it's both in full documentation loan and loan documentation loans. And then you find somewhat similar magnitudes for misreported non owner occupants, about 6% of loans that represented itself as being for Borrowers who intend to live in a house actually have borrowers who did not reside in a house. It was a, either a speculative acquisition or a second home. And there's some overlap between these two things. So overall in the marketplace, about one out of 10 loans was misrepresented in this fashion. And remember, because we are looking on two characteristics, it's likely a lower bound to the misrepresentation in this marketplace. This is kind of all over the country. The, the red is the worst. You can kind of see coastal areas. Florida are particularly bad. In terms of a time series, it was growing over time. It peaked just before the kind of just, just about a half a year to a year before the crisis, and then there was a contraction. So it seems that somehow markets tried to start to correct this problem just before the crisis happened. Of course, from the perspective of investors, what matters, does it economically matter? Does it generate loss? I'm sure you misrepresented my loan, but what is really the economic impact? So let me show you just two simple graphs. This path shows you the cumulative default rates of a loan that told investors there is no second lien, and actually it was true, there was no second lien. This is during the first eight quarters of a loan life, so you can see that the cumulative defaults are about 15, a little bit more than 15%. This is 
what investors were thinking they were getting. They were thinking, I'm getting a yellow default path. And this is all controlling for observable differences. This is for average loans. So what effectively they got, if the loan is misre misreported, if, if it has a second, the probability of default is 70% higher in relative terms. So in other words, investor bought a yellow path of default, but in fact got the red one. And a very similar things happen with misreported non owner occupants. And Chris has a great amount of work showing the same thing in, in, his, in his prior work, that you know, non-owner occupants are risky guys because they don't reside in a home. So again, investors thought they get a yellow default path, but actually the default was 60% higher. And this is all controlling for house prices, regional things, and so on and so forth. Pricing, OK, maybe it was priced in. Maybe they knew it is risky, but they get compensated by that. So essentially what we find is that market kept quite a lot, despite the popular opinions about what was disclosed information. So for example, if, if sellers of these securities told investors, this is a security with a large CLTV, high CLTV, the prices would be lower. High CLTV means more risk. The prices will be lower in the sense the yields will be higher and subordination levels will be higher. Subordination level is a fraction of the pool that protects the most safe senior tranches. The higher it, it is usually you sell pool for less money because it's a measure of a risk of the pool. What we find out is that market cared about disclosed variables. For example, the higher the CLTV disclosed, the higher the yield, the higher subordination level, but did not price in misrepresentation. So pools with a lot of misrepresented loans were priced in a very similar manner as pools with less misrepresented loans. And as a result, you can argue it allows the sellers of these securities to sell for more. Let me just give you an example of a Lehman Brothers pool. These guys reported to investors a 80% CLTV pool in average. There's a sizable amount of loans in the pool, and average CLTV was 80%. It translates into certain yield spread and subordination level of about 40 basis points yield spread and subordination level of 17%. The actual CLTV was 10% higher because of this second yields. It was not 80%, it was 90%, almost 90%. So if you use a pricing function, if you see what would be the price of this pool had Lehman Brothers disclosed this information to investors, the yield would uh, substantially go up and subordination levels would be higher. That means essentially that uh, the price of this pool would be less. So in other words, this misrepresentation, I'm not saying they did, they did this intentionally, but they allow them to make more money. And remember, underwriters just earn a fraction of the pool value. So for them, for example, if you can sell a security for 1% more than the true worth, for the underwriter, it could be 100% increase in their profits. So in other words, despite that this misrepresentation may not, in a big scheme of the account for tremendous amount of you know, volume of the assets, there could be an important incentive for underwriters to make this deal. Because remember, for them, selling security just for 50 basis points more, for 0.5%, given that that their profit might be in the order of 1%, 2% of the pool at most, this is a huge impact on their profitability. Who is doing it? Essentially everybody. You know, and the bad news, we are hoping we find a few bad apples. And of course, Lehman Brothers countrywide are leading the pack. But then we also see that this is the, the extent of this representation across underwriters. We see it fairly prevalent. And as Chris said, if we look on, if, if investors would enforce representation and why then legally would be treated as such, just based on this two misrepresentation, you could have $160 billion of repurchases. Of course, not every of these loans defaults, and those that default will have some recovery value. So at least with direct losses of $60 billion to the, to the market. And again, this is a lower bound because we are not looking on inflated appraisals, manipulated FICO scores, and so on and so forth. So just leading towards our discussion, I want to raise a few issues. So we interpret this evidence as, and I'll leave it to the panelists to, to talk more about it, as saying, there was a widespread misrepresentation in the marketplace. Essentially, all underwriters, most reputable institutions were involved in that. And it's despite presence of explicit guarantees. And, uh, and it's also an important reason why the market has frozen. I'm sure the, the, the bill will comment on that. You know, the one reason the investors don't want to come back and private capital is not flowing to the market is because investors say, look, this previous structure simply is not working. I'm not going to invest billions of dollars of my money when I don't have anything to say I'm not protected. What could be the reason for that? And I leave the panelists to maybe touch on it. Well, we didn't have before the big crisis in, in securitization of residential real estate, so maybe it's a lack of experience. 
It's also always a possibility the management of these banks sometimes take them on, on the right, on the beat, on, on <coughs> screwing both investors, but as well as equity holders of these banks. I think Lehman Brothers equity holders are also not happy. <coughs> the Lehman and Countrywide are out. Another thing is in order to sue, and, and you are, and many of you, of course, are lawyers, there were fairly high legislative hurdles to enforce this representation and warranties. Usually you have to have at least 25% of the pool, given the sparse heterogeneous <coughs> nature of the market, it creates coordination problems. So just, just last minute, what are the potential solutions to that? I think the one simple thing that can be done at a not big cost is standardized disclosure, make the uh, sellers of these securities provide an automated file that investors can very easily analyze, and such files could be fed into uh, you know, due diligence software like something we developed here. So that would potentially help a little bit transparency of the market. But the issues we might want to discuss is, do we want to have, uh, you know, do we want to have 25%? Well, maybe we should uh, lower the legislative hurdles uh, and so on and so forth. And the last thing, and I'm just finishing, is of course we could also include risk retention measures or just change the ways we originate mortgages. And I'll leave it to the panelists for discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Tomek. Um, so I think I may actually switch gears. You have a PowerPoint. One. One. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Alan to go next, and I'm going to go to Bill. We had originally done the order, but that way we can get the PowerPoint done, and uh, then, we'll, then we'll put this up, lights on, and uh, um, you know, gloves off uh, in, the, uh, in the conversation. So does somebody have? If I touch this, this will break. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, so it's great to be here. I just introduced myself very quickly. I'm a professor at Harvard. I've also been involved in some of the litigation that was referenced earlier. And what I want to do is just raise some common issues that I've seen in the litigation surrounding mortgage-backed securities uh, and, and some things that have been focal points there. Uh, the first thing I want to say, and I find this interesting, and it dovetails with the comments that we just heard, is Let's think about losses on mortgage-backed securities that investors have suffered. So we have a pool of mortgages, there's losses on those mortgages. Uh, and let's say the mortgage-backed security goes from $100 to $80, just to keep things simple. From the bank's perspective, the bank that sponsored the special purpose vehicle that issued the NBS, they're going to face at least two lawsuits, potentially. One is by the special purpose vehicle, the entity that held the mortgages, and they're going to sue potentially pursuant to the repurchase agreement that was referenced earlier, and they might sue for $20. And the investors in the special purpose vehicle, so they're holding the NDS, they can sue the bank as well under Section 11, or very well could sue the bank under Section 11, potentially or arguably for $20. So one interesting thing is, is that um, from the sponsoring bank's perspective, they're going to potentially face $40 in liability for $20 and losses given these two different lawsuits by different entities but for the same losses. Now that being said, there's going to be legal issues in recovering that, but there, these are two very important sources of, of losses, uh, lawsuits and it's working off of the same losses. Moreover, uh, from the financial institution perspective, they're going to face and have faced litigation obviously by their investors saying, you had all this risk expo exposures, maybe some of it's on their balance sheet, they're going to be facing 10 v 5 liability uh, as well. Uh, and the third category of litigation, certainly not the only one, is asset managers. Uh, you, you know, the claim is you were managing our assets, you had investment guidelines, and you ended up buying all this junk that blew up, uh, and you have <coughs> litigation arising out of that. Now, what I want to emphasize is in all this litigation, uh, the time of purchase really matters a lot, or it's a focal point of the litigation. So when was, were these NDS securities purchased? When did the investors who brought, brought equity, say, in Citibank or whatever, Citigroup, when did they purchase? So what was the time of purchase? And it li links up with the comments that we just heard, which is if even assuming liability, assuming that were misrepresentations, either about the bank, about what was on their balance sheet, or by the SPV in terms of the true nature of the mortgages, what was the pricing distortion at the time of purchase not ex post. So you could have a misrepresentation about second liens, and that might generate large losses ex post as housing markets decline. But what was the pricing impact at the time of purchase? And so we saw one simulation of 24 basis points 
I assure you that's going to be much lower damages if it works off the pricing distortion than the ex post losses. Enormous difference. So the time of purchase really matters. And let me, let me illustrate this in a different way. This is uh, uh, a very uh, widely known uh, chart. This is the ABX. The ABX is credit default swaps on mortgage-backed securities. On, to be more specific, uh, in this chart, subprime AAA mortgage-backed securities. So it's a pricing metric. It's actually market prices on the cost of insuring against default on subprime <coughs> AAA mortgages. Now, these are focused on uh, 20 specific MBS subprime mortgages. But again, the point here is it's a market-based assessment of the risk of AAA mortgage-backed securities, generally speaking. Uh, it's not specific um, to necessarily any specific portfolio. Um, and you can see this is tracking different vintages of AAA subprime mortgages. Uh, 2006 01, the first half of 06, uh, 2000, uh, later in 06 and then in 07. And what you see is that the, the change in the pricing of the insurance on subprime AAA uh, really cracks uh, in August of 07. And then it has a partial recovery in September of 07. And then you really see the very large uh, decline in the ABX in October of 07. So it just, you know, there's lots of other things you can look at, but just in terms of the ABX, when did the market start to think that subprime AAA, at least using this metric, was really problematic? You know, arguably it's the fall of 07, and not coincidentally, this is when the banks started having huge write-offs on their, on their super senior portfolios. Um, if you're purchasing as AAA subprime uh, back in 06 or, or even early 07, you might have a hard time showing a pricing distortion at CME relative to, to other types of, of securities. So again, what I want to emphasize is not that there isn't a pricing distortion, but the timing is going to be incredibly important here. Uh, another word on just sort of the evolution of the, of the financial crisis, I have some charts on this, but I'll just tell you, uh, housing prices peaked in 06, in summer, fall of 06, you could use Kay Schiller. There's some other housing price uh, source, pricing sources you could use. So it did peak in mid or fall of 06. However, the decline that occurred thereafter is largely within historical norms. So if you go back to data starting in 1969, the decline in the median aftermath of 06 is within historical norms. Once you get into the fall of 07, August, September, October of 07, the housing price declines, and this is re reflected in the housing futures market, really started to take on unprecedented housing declines. And this is coincidental with the fall in the AAA. So we're going to be eating up the subordination, uh, and the AAA is going to be affected. And so it's just another way of saying that in the litigation, uh, there's, um, the time of purchase and the pricing distortion is really going to be important in terms of of, um, of, of potentially damages. In the 10b-5 litigation, the way 10b-5 litigation works is, as probably many of you know, is what is the inflation band? What's the inflation in this price, let's say it's stock, at the time of, of, of purchase? And so we're gonna have to use some kind of pricing formula that we just saw to, to, get, to get an answer to that, rather than um, necessarily ex post losses. So anyway, this is a huge, I guess what I'm going to leave you with is the time of purchase and pricing distortion at the time of purchase is a huge battleground in the litigation, uh, and things like the ABX AAA loom very large there. And particularly since the AAA, we don't have a lot of good market prices for this stuff. Uh, the ABX is one of the few market prices that we have, rather than something that's model based. Uh, and then, uh, as, as uh, the paper is very fine, but it reminds me of. Uh, Statement by Warren Buffett. He said, "I wish I could measure my, I wish I could have my weight market to model." Uh, so <laughs> you can have a lot of arguments about the proper model, and so there is a preference to try to use market prices, and and, and that's where the ABX comes up. Um, triple B ABX. It's going to be a different story. Uh, er, that that started to show losses in the ABX credit default swap market earlier, and so obviously uh, my statements are going to hinge on. You know, the, the, the type of security that we're talking about. And I haven't gotten to the issue about what the market knew and didn't know, and that's, that's a separate set of issues. So let me stop there, and I'll, I'll turn it over. Great. Thanks.
Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alan. Um, and we'll, we can pull this up now. So just to what I wanted to do is just for a second kind of, I think, clarify some of the distinctions between these two guys and I'm going to go to Bill um, as our next comment. So if you sort of think about the evidence that um, Tomek presented, there's two ways of thinking about that evidence. One of them is to think about what people would have paid when they were buying the securities differences in yields. So if you take the estimate, for example, from the one pool of 38 basis points over instead of um, pricing at what, 70, no, 68? Yeah, 24. 24, so 24 basis points. There was about $2 trillion of subprime securities originated. So if you were to look at the pricing differences on 24 basis points, taking that estimate and projecting, and that estimate was for one pool, not for the entire set of pools, you would end up with an estimate of 0.24% of about two trillion, which is about $48 billion. Is it 24 basis points a year or 24 basis, 24 basis points up front, one, one time on the calculation. A different way of looking at it is what were the actual losses? So if you look between the yellow and the red lines that Tomek talked about, those are kind of ex post losses associated with the pools given the actual experience we, we had, which was worse than people expected. And if you were to look at that estimate, just based on these calculations, you get an estimate of $60 billion, which is based on the number of loan, the, the losses on the $160 billion of loans associated with this, and that was based on the specific house price experience we had. So my guess is the 24 basis points probably overstates it because that was a relatively tough pool. So if you sort of thought, you know, you would at least get differences of 50% or more between calculations that were based on the misrepresentations given the actual experience or what people might have paid up front. And so that some kind of benchmark of how you would look at is that a fair? Can I, can I, re I, I absolutely correct it. Another way to make the same point, I don't mean to interrupt, is what's the but for world? Mm -hmm. The world that should have obtained, assuming that alleged misconduct didn't occur. Is the but for world it, the world where you're told the truth about the loans and then you buy it and you, you get a higher yield um, and pay a lower price? Or is the but for world a world where you're told the truth and then you don't buy at all? Or maybe you say you would have bought treasuries or, or right. something else. So it's, it's really the formulation of the but for world is, is another way to put the point up. Okay, so is it quickly, because I want, I want to go to Bill to, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to sort of frame the issue in a sense, because then I want to really hear the perspective from somebody who was looking at these markets in real time from the investor perspective. I think that's kind of our next um, place to go to, uh, to kind of hear the perspective on where we are. So Bill, I'd love to... Yeah. Uh, let me give a brief summary of my background. Uh, I worked at major broker dealers until 1995. I started in the securitization industry in 1981. 1995, I broke off. I got back in from DLJ, created my own firm, and started doing my own mortgage-backed security deals. My basic business model was that I kept the credit risk on the transactions, which made it easier for me to sell the senior pieces. Um, for me to take the credit risk on the transactions, I had to have control over the underwriting of the pool. The underwriting not from the dealing with the homeowner, but from the selection and uh, removal of bad loans from the actual pools. Um, looking at that, I was able to get effectively a time series of how um, mortgage-backed securities pools degraded over time. Um, and to put it in perspective, I stopped doing private label securitization in the U.S. in 2004. And it wasn't because I was magnanimous or anything like that. I couldn't simply not find pools that met a reasonable credit criteria. Um, and, uh, you know, this goes to the whole Dodd-Frank thing of having skin in the deal. Um, I was keeping the, the bottom risk classes and it just didn't make economic sense to take a pool that I was losing money on. Um, to put it in perspective, as far as I know, I was the only, uh, economically, I was not only putting transactions together, I was a, a taker of credit risk, and there were about five hedge funds that were doing this, taking the bottom pieces. I was the absolutely only one 
that was asking for pool or loan level data in transactions. Several dealers would not bother dealing with me because I was a pain in the neck in requiring this information before I would do a transaction. So Lehman Brothers never did it. Bear Stern stopped doing it after about 2002. Um, and that, that was it. But the information was available to subordinate investors, to senior investors. All they had to do was ask. Um, the second thing they had to do is they had to have the ex expertise to figure out what, and it's called a loan tape, it's actually an Excel file, what all this gobbledygook meant because they got 200 fields and 5,000 loans. Um, and there's very, very few that would bother to actually look at that, and I would put that very, very few as virtually zero. Um, when I started, um, uh, without using a name, but I, I sat down with a major, major investor. Um, and you could pick one of two or three names that would come to your head in the US. And I, this was in 2009. Um, and they had called me and asked me to come in to explain what the litigation was about. I was suing Bank of America at the time. And they asked how I had represented to Congress that my assets were not taking catastrophic losses. And given that I had subordinate bonds, and I explained that I went through and I cleaned out the pools. So if there were loans in the pools that were unacceptable, for example, if the cumulative LTV was too high and um, the guy didn't have a lot of income, that was obviously uh, it was a crap loan and we just take it out. Um, they said they did not know they could do that. And the head of fixed income said, well, what happened to those loans. And I had the pleasure of saying that he owned them. So they just went in the next transaction. And I would see them go, if I did two or three transactions in a row with the same originator, going from dealer to dealer, the same loan would pop up and I'd just pick it out the next month. So they essentially did not even know that they were supposed to do their homework. And the reason for that is if you, you you're you have a 50 or 100 billion dollar position and you're buying 50 million dollars at a pop. You're just a continuous flow of, of transactions and bonds coming through your office and you would need a staff to actually go through the loan files. You'd have to get the dealers to cooperate with you and giving them to you. And then you'd have to have a staff go through and that's really economically what the rating agencies are supposed to do. But rating agencies of a bunch of 23-year-olds that want to end up working at Lehman Brothers, who wanted to end up working at Lehman Brothers, and they're never really effectively going to challenge them. So the, the information was there if someone wanted to take the time and energy to find it. And um, people ask me why I did it, and, and the simple question, the simple answer is it was my money. Um, you know, it wasn't being magnanimous or anything else like that. The, and the business model of me keep, keeping the bottom pieces allowed me to sell the senior pieces at a slightly higher spread, slightly tighter spread, which when you're levering it literally 300 to one, two or three basis points adds up to a lot of money and it means that the bottom piece became very, very cheap for me, if it worked. Um, so uh, that's really, from, a, from a, an investor's perspective, this was, if you wanted to take the time, it was possible to get this information and get it beyond the capacity or, or beyond the, the scope of the, the, the perspectives. However, what subsequently ended up happening was that the information on the loan files, as Tomek is proving, showing, was factually incorrect. And that, an investor could not get past that level of information. Um, the other things that, that I can talk about from an investor's perspective is within the transaction, the originators made certain reps and warranties as far as the quality of the asset. <coughs> so in addition to saying that these were non-owner occupied houses, or they were owner occupied houses, they had representations in there that said if they proved to be non-owner occupied houses, we will buy it back. Those did not have conditions on it saying we will buy it back at anything other than par. So the question is, what are those representations worth? And 
the rating agencies were relying on those representations and investors were relying on those representations. And if you're a reputable institution and you say, we will buy these back if they're not what we say they are, the question is, is that enforceable? And that's what's being litigated now in a number of cases. Um, and you know there are barriers for investors to get to the courtroom. Some I found out the hard way. Um, the you know the twenty five percent no action clause, which are, is someone going to speak on that today? Or um, I, I was actually going to come back to you to sort of talk about okay. some of those issues okay. and then have Jeff uh, okay. comment on those. So it'd be great because. You act, I mean, you are leading some of the litigation to try and get standing to, right. so it would be great to talk a little bit about, you know, dig into the weeds Don't a little bit more, yeah, okay. to talk about that, and then I'm going to get Jeff to um, comment on this. Within these securitizations, there's a requirement that you have 25% of the pool to um, have legal standing to, to challenge the securitization, to challenge the reps and warrants, and so on and so forth. Um, that was a barrier, not a hurdle, uh, because these securitizations were sold all over the world. So one of my clients was the largest bank in a G8 country, I'll leave it at that, uh, that in 2006 handed me their portfolio and said, what's going on in your banana republic? And I went through and I explained the provisions within they had maybe a hundred different deals. And there were NIM bonds and there were conflicts of interest in, within the securitization with NIM bonds and there were conflicts with servicers and guys that owned NIM bonds bought the servicing and were changing the servicing protocols and so on and so forth. Um, they promptly sold absolutely everything they had. Um, and if you would like an interesting phone call, it's to have some foreigners yelling at you every five minutes have a long conference call and every five or ten minutes a different guy chimes in and says, do you like living in Venezuela? Do you, you know, um, and so what, what they also had asked was, how can we solve this, which is how can you solve this? And I said, this is a, a relatively easy problem to solve. I could call ten friends of mine and get them to call ten friends and we'll put a database together of all the investors in the world and it will take a month or so. So a month later, I spoke to them, and I had exactly zero uh, investors. And it proved to be a much harder problem. But what I started doing in 2006 was aggregating investors one at a time. And by 2009, we had about 70% of the investors in the world in a central database, which gave me legal standing in virtually every securitization out there. Uh, not me, it gave the aggregate database, the aggregate investors. Um, this was a rather interesting database, and it's now, without getting into much detail, there was a part, part of the way, a lot of the way the, the database was built was I sued Bank of America in 2009 on a class basis to try and get legal standing. The logic, and I hate to say this in a room full of lawyers because I'm going to be wrong, was if you need 25%, and you have a common interest, if the judge asks the first question of do you have a common interest, then by definition you have 25%. If the judge asks the question of do you have 25% and then a common interest, then the answer, you never get to the common interest question. On the merits of the case, it was very obvious that it was absolutely correct. So I did not, the, the judge asked the 25% question and then the, we never got to the second question. That was in the beginning, the late, 2008 that I sued, and what that did was it brought this issue to the forefront and literally investors all over the world called me and said what's going on. So that's how I got the Germans and the English and the Chinese and you name it into a database that um, in aggregate they had class, they had the, the ability to enforce their, their claims. Right now, much of that is being litigated in New York. Um, with the Bank of America settlement, and um, there's about 60,000 of my emails that's being argued back and forth between AIG and BlackRock and PIMCO as to whether they should be admitted as evidence. Um, I'm 
agnostic in that. Um, however, what is has become very public is that there was a, a group of 100 investors, BlackRock and Pimco split off from it at the last minute, and took a group of 20 investors and created their own settlement or trying to impose it on the 100. Some of the 100 are objecting to it, and it's now in the court. Um, one could suspect why BlackRock and Pimco would want to break off, uh, especially when BlackRock was 45% owned by Bank of America, who owned Countrywide. So you, you know, that's just, those are the facts, and it is being argued right now. Um, I don't know how it's going to end up coming out. I don't know whether the emails will become public. Um, so uh, effectively, the, the, the investors are constrained on seeking redress in court due to this 25% claim. And the purpose of the 25% claim is to prevent a small investor from green mailing the trust. So there's, you know, a, a yin and a yang there as to whether that makes makes sense. Great. Thank you very much, Bill. And let me just kind of, as the moderator, sort of put in the context of the numbers that we were talking about earlier, how one thinks about this. So if you were, you know, again, take $160 billion as an estimate of the total size of loans where there was some misrepresentation. There's essentially two way, we talked about sort of two different approaches to think about the liability. One of them was ex ante, which is what's the change in spread, and one of them is sort of an ex post, what were the actual losses. There's a different approach to thinking about this, which is also the idea of the reps and warranties. And what the reps and warranties were in part was the originator of the securitization of the sponsor saying, by the way, the information I gave you on the tape was accurate. The, one of the potential remedies of that, this is having an economist explain legal issues is always a mistake, but despite that, in a, in a room of lawyers, um, but despite that caveat, I'm gonna sort of go forward because I think I'm, and you guys will correct me if I've sort of gotten this wrong, the issue, one of the other remedies is that any of the loans that were misrepresented must be purchased back by the sponsor of the securitization. So in other words, that generates, gets back to an ex post definition of liability, of, of sort of liability, I don't say liability, but an ex post definition of losses, because if there were 160 billion of uh, misrepresented loans and the actual losses in the $160 billion was 60 billion. That is the write-off of the 160, 60 billion of it was lost, so you were left with 100 left. Um, if they have to buy out the 160 billion of loans back out, that means those losses ultimately are all going to go, the ex post losses are all going to go to um, the sponsors of the securitization. So when people talk about losses or settlements of eight cents on the dollar, which is what some people kind of are referring to as a settlement with um, the proposed settlement that is being litigated with Bank of America, that's the sort of debate is what's the, what should they, what is the remedy if you think about this? And there are different approaches to thinking about what the remedy is and part of those involve legal standing. And I would say virtually none of these were issues that at the time people really thought through very seriously. In other words, the 25% was probably much more about the issue of green mail as opposed to at the time having been thought about as an issue associated with standing and the kind of the scale of the issues that came up. So this is a point where I'd like to come to Jeff to sort of talk about and kind of put some of these sorts of, uh, these sorts of um, issues into perspective. I'm uh, gonna take um somewhat different um, approach to um, uh, uh, the discussion we've had thus far in the following way. So this is the Global Justice Forum. Um, and uh, two critical words, one of which is global and then the second of which is justice. So um, the various issues that are served up today, um, mortgage-backed securities, the LIBOR case, uh, protecting workplace standards in the global supply chain, cross-border cybercrime, are issues where, although the actions may occur in one place, the harms are worldwide. So, so as, as 
Bill was saying, um, uh, the, the fraud that occurred in the United States leaves folks in uh, the rest of the world wondering how do they get remedy in uh, the, the US or how do they get redress for what appears to be a wide scale fraud. So the harm occurs in one place, uh, but the impact is worldwide. In the LIBOR case, the fraud appears to have occurred in the UK, but the impact of the LIBOR uh, misstatements obviously affect financial instruments world, worldwide. So that's the, the global part of the global justice forum. The justice part is the issue of how do you get redress for wrongs that have occurred. And so um, uh, the perspective that I'd like to bring to this panel on, mortgage, on, on fraud in, in mortgage-backed securitization is precisely that question, because what we've had is a discussion of the challenges involving uh, private law approaches to, uh, to, 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 to widespread fraud. How do the individual investors get recovery? And the many challenges that the litigation system serves up. And, and part of the problem there is that rules that, in a certain sense of the world, may make sense. So the 25% rule is, you know, you probably see it in a lot of bond indentures. <laughs> and <coughs> the flip side of it, do you really want an activist hedge fund? buying, you know, 5% of the bonds of a particular issue, uh, being able to challenge the actions of the trustee, and essentially having to be bought out at a par when there have been losses in, in the pool that are not necessarily because of fraud, but because the world turned out in a bad way and some colorable allegation might be made. So one way to protect, in effect, um, uh, 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 everybody else in the pool and to protect the, the, um, uh, uh, the ability to market these things is to have a rule like 25%, which in a case like this is not just um, a hurdle, but is a barrier to actions that I think um, we all think ought to be brought forward in light of the egregious behavior that occurred. This is not like a hedge fund finding some tricky covenant default in deciding to accelerate repayment of a particular issue, right, in an opportunistic way, for which the 25% rule may be some protection. This is sort of like an egregious case of fraud for which, which nobody contemplated. Well, I, I don't want to say that, but, but, but let's hope that nobody was thinking that the 25% rule would be a shield um, against the possibility for uh, recovery action against fraud. So this brings the question of public enforcement versus the private enforcement directly to, to the fore, uh, which is what I want to um, talk about. And so the, um, as an alternative approach to private litigation, we might have the, uh, the enforcement efforts of, of, for example, the Department of Justice, um, not just criminal, but monetary enforcement action. We've seen the criminal action, that's one approach, but it might be that there are civil, uh, civil damages or at least a civil, a civil remedy which could be pursued in which at least uh, it's not clear how the fruits are going to be um, given out, but, but at least would involve an economic penalty against uh, the institutions that benefited from the fraud. And so the Justice Department has begun to use the Financial Institutions Re Reform, Recovery, and Enforcement Act of 1989, otherwise known as FIREA, to investigate and pursue cases of financial fraud. So the FIREA statute was put in place 20 years ago to deal with uh, the collapse of the thrift industry and the fraud that occurred there. It lay dormant for 20 years and now X years after the financial crisis, the Department of Justice has begun to use it. And so the major investigations that you've maybe read about, with very large numbers attached to it, um, S&P, $5 billion, B of A, there have been numbers of $11 billion uh, to start as the, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, $11 billion and going up is the potential settlement amount. Um, B of A, I'm not sure there's a number yet, but 
Um, uh, so, so these are very significant uh, monetary fines, as it were, that are being uh, that will be levied against major financial institutions in respect of the financial fraud that um, uh, uh, that that occurred. So. Um, one of the interesting things, there are a couple interesting things about the Faria statute. One of which is that, in effect, there, for the most, why it's powerful is because it's triggered by a, a, a so-called predicate offense. In the case of, 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 of a lot of the Justice Department actions against S&P and um, uh, the banks, um, wire fraud, which is a very capaciously written uh, uh, statute for those who know anything about um, about um, uh, the white co uh, the white uh, color uh, rules in these areas, and so in effect, if you can show that there's been a violation of an underlying predicate statute here, wire fraud, a very broad definition of fraud, which which affects that's the magic word, which affects a federally insured deposit institution such as a bank then there is the basis for a remedy. And there's violations which are essentially $1 million a pop. And, if you, and, and depending on how you define what's a violation, you get to large numbers in a very rapid way. Um, and, and so again, this is the basis, as I say, for uh, large dollar actions being brought against S&P and against uh, JPMC and against other such um, cases. Um, the, 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 the tricky issue here, or, or, or the sort of the novel issue here, is what does it mean to affect a federal financial institution? So you might think, just on sort of a casual reading of this, that in effect, sorry, that, that, that the statute is aimed at against third parties who have behaved in a way so as to defraud a federal financial institution cause harm to the federal financial institution, thereby um, uh, 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 put its solvency at risk and, and, and a threat to the FDIC uh, because of the deposit insurance fund. Um, and to be sure, the S&P case involves such an action. S&P committed fraud, the claim is, which had negative impacts on banks. But, but the definition of effect in a series of recent cases, which in the interest of time I'm not going to describe in detail, has been broadened to include fraud committed by the bank itself. So if the bank commits a fraud, um, then the argument is, is that because there, there will be follow-on effects of the fraud once discovered, those follow-on effects, because the bank will have to pay damages, um, the bank will suffer sort of uh, the loss in the marketplace of its credibility. All of those things negatively affect the bank. So, so therefore, in effect, fraud committed by the bank <laughs> is deemed to negatively affect the bank and therefore give the Justice Department an action to sue the bank for fraud, of which it was the beneficiary. Um, this, this uh, view has been, uh, uh, the Southern District now has three cases taking this broad view of what it means to uh, affect the bank um, by some very good judges. And although there hasn't been a definitive appellate ruling, um, nevertheless, I, I think um, uh, um, you know, the cases seem to have enough strength and enough following that they have very high um, settlement value, I think. Um, so, so, so the argument is again, effect uh, has broad reach if, if one can show that the institution is exposed to new or increased risk of loss, even without a showing of actual loss. So it's not only uh, that the bank has uh, suffered loss in respect of the fraud that it has committed, but it has increased the risk of loss. And so you see, um, a very broad reach to the public enforcement tool, the FIREA public enforcement tool. Final point here um, as, as to this tool is that the statute of limitations is not just three years, five years um, associated with fraud, particularly under some of the limitations of um, 
of uh, the PSLRA and other uh, federal statutes. The statute of limitations here is 10 years, um, which is a great advantage because um, uh, 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 Tamar's work is now five years after the financial crisis. So in a way, the shock has occurred, and it's taken a while, really, for the forensic work after the fact to reveal the nature and the extent of the fraud. Um, uh, um, so, so the 10-year look back is proving to be very powerful. Similarly, the Justice Department has very powerful discovery rights, uh, which is not true in all uh, circumstances. And so the Justice Department has, has put enormous effort into investigating exactly what occurred at S&P and, and what is going to put similar such effort into what's occurring at the banks. And so this public enforcement tool um, uh, uh, is an alternative approach to seeking redress for the fraud that occurred. It's not so clear to me that the investors who, um, uh, that the investors who suffered loss will get recovery out of the FIREA funds once paid. But on the other hand, um, the government itself was a loser, obviously Fannie Freddie, but also uh, the, uh, the enormous government aid in the face of the financial crisis. And if the point of enforcement um, uh, is in some uh, important way to provide um, ex post penalty for egregious cases of fraud, then the public enforcement route uh, may be necessary and help solve some of the limitations to private remedial, remedial approaches that we see in the case of mortgage-backed securities and that we'll be discussing in the LIBOR case. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so I'm going to have one quick um, question that I'm going to run across all the panelists in the same order and then I want to open up. But it really was exactly where, um, and I would like to get a couple of questions in, it was exactly where Jeff left off, which is the issue of it may be fine to have headline damages, but investors, in order to be willing to put their capital up in the future, um, if they're not receiving the damages or, or a significant portion of them, although they were arguably the ones most directly affected, how do we exactly bring them back to the table in the future to provide the $2 trillion of capital to restart the financial system and just the mortgage system? And just to give you a sense of order of magnitude, you know, there are about $10 trillion, or actually a little less today, of mortgages outstanding in the country. So, you know, out of about $20 trillion of housing, you know, plus or minus a little bit value. So we do need very large amounts of private capital that used to be provided in order to reduce the government role in the system. And so investor confidence in what's happening and their view of how they've taken losses and will be treated in the future obviously plays a very important role in terms of people being willing to put up trillions of dollars of their money and again not only Americans but people around the world where these capital markets have gone. So I wanted to just start with you and this is literally I want a minute or two answer just how do you just very quick thoughts on what we need to do to bring out, bring back private capital, whether the outcome of this has an effect. So I'll start with Tomac. That so I've that already bit. touched on yeah. some of these issues to be very brief. So one thing, the definitely disclosure of information has to be improved. Ideally also standardized. We talked recently with Security Exchange Commission. It would be good to add some gravity to this information the same way it operates in public capital markets like New York Stock Exchange. And secondly, as Bill was saying, and I'm sure Bill will have more to say about it from the investor side, it's very important also the enforcement. So not only clarifying what representation warranties really exactly mean and make this legal language as precise as possible, but we need an institution that can enforce these things and potentially lowering the legal hurdles and have a trustee that really works on the side of investors is controlled by them. They could seek their rights to sort of sue potentially to an organization controlled by investors and I think that would help a lot. Well, I, I, I completely agree with the standardization. If you look at these prospectuses, it's in desperate need of standardization, and that obviously creates an information cost just to figuring out, even assuming that it's truthful disclosure. So I, 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 I 
I completely agree with that. Obviously, part of the private capital issue is the role of Fannie and Freddie, and that gets into the issue of, of uh, the fees that should be uh, charged for guarantees that they're providing, and maybe you could uh, increase those fees in various segments of the market that to create space uh, there for private capital. Bill. You're by far the most constrained by short time because I know okay. this is a subject we've spent hours talking right. about. Um, just uh, after 2004, I went and created the, I did the first Russian asset-backed deal and the first Russian mortgage-backed deal. I had the uh, pleasure of literally designing a securitization system from a blank piece of paper. Um, and then I went out and had to sell that to the same investors that now don't want to buy US mortgage-backed securities. I was asked three questions by every single investor that bought this. Is there an adequate deed recording system? Is there uh, foreclosure laws that work? And do I have access to courts to redress my grievances? Um, right now, we've had a scandal with MERS we have a deed recording system that has Bartleby the Scrivener sitting there with a quill pen. And I can go through how these evolved over time. It's a patchwork that is garbage. The only way I can say it is it's garbage. The foreclosure laws were interfered with by politicians. Mm -hmm. And right now in New York State, if you stop paying on your mortgage, it'll take five years for you to lose your house. That's five years of free rent, no taxes. It also has an effect on a neighborhood because no one paints their house when they're getting foreclosed. Um, then access to the courts. Well, if I tried to sue on a class basis, trying to have, that was not uh, obviously an attempt to green mail it because if I'm trying to do it as a class, I had expertise to do this. If I'm trying to do it as a class, I'm obviously working, trying to work for the entire trust. That was denied. Um, so. Of the three questions I was asked over and over for private capital to come into the Russian market, we are 0 for 3. And if there's anybody in Washington or anybody in this room that's wondering whether we're going to have private capital by the trillions flowing into this market when we're 0 for 3, I can clue you in on something. The answer is no. And I've asked foreign investors what it would take for them to invest in the US mortgage-backed market. I've never gotten an answer. I just get howls of laughter. So, so that's just the very basics. I mean, we, we as a country paid for Russia's deed recording system through um, the World Bank because when the Soviets went away, they privatized housing there. Housing was government owned, and if you were in the apartment, they handed you a deed for fifty bucks or something. Prior to doing that, they created a modern deed recording system. So we have to literally look to <coughs> former Soviet Union and former Eastern Union, Eastern, Eastern uh, uh, Bloc countries for a proper deed recording system. It works. I, and I was able to do the securitization without deed insurance, without mortgage insurance, which is about a 1% cost in the US. No problem. It worked. Um, they did change their foreclosure laws because they had Soviet-era laws. They became what I consider to be overly draconian, but that's neither here nor there. If you have a lien, you can foreclose. Um, the access to the courts, I did the securitization under English law out of a Dutch SPV. Access to the English courts, which are viewed, I think, around the world as being impartial. I think they're viewed as vastly superior to American courts. We want private capital to come back. Those are the first three questions we should be looking at. And it's, it's, then there's a whole host of other nuances in these transactions, conflicts of interest, and so on and so forth. But without access to the courts, without, access, without proper deed recording, and without political interference in the uh, uh, securing your interest and, and foreclosing and putting the asset back into circulation, then I think we're dead on the road. Since I don't have any money to put at risk, um, <laughs> I can have a more. Twenty bucks, we can go in together. It's true, right? <laughs> I can have a more 
uh, I guess, a more optimistic take than, than Bill, but I think he's been through the wars and maybe he's suffering from post-stress. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you actually have talked to Bill too then. <laughs> so maybe the more optimistic approach might be, A, if public enforcement uh, were um, included criminal exposure and um, were credible, then perhaps parties um, could rely uh, in a more, uh, could, could rely differently on the good behavior of so many of the intermediaries to perform as one would expect them to perform in a reasonable commercial way. So that's one possibility, right? If we hang a few people, or uh, we're, Figuratively speaking, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. Um, We're so, moving so to a different part of the world for justice it's, it's now. Really exactly right. But maybe enforcement, uh, maybe through more credible uh, enforcement, then uh, the intermediaries seem to be held held account. But but um, I, I, I want to come back to a point that you made though right at the beginning, which is to say, if the underwriting parties retain the retain risk. So, in a sense, um, uh, um, uh, there is some responsible party um, in the chain who has, who, who, who had, uh, who, who basically originated in some broad sense the underlying mortgages. Um, and perhaps there might be risk retention at other points of the chain as well. Why wouldn't that, in effect, that kind of um, you know, first party insurance, as it were, I mean, why wouldn't the, the bonds posted by the originators through risk retention be um, uh, sufficient to restore the credibility to uh, the market? Because after all, the, a lot of the risks that you referred to, um, you know, the fact that our deed recording system is, is uh, fragile, broken, et cetera, it's hard to get enforced. You know, that's, that's just, it's foreseeable in a certain way. Um, you can charge for it in the sense that, you know, uh, uh, the interest rate is higher or whatever. Um, the, the part that seems troubling is that those things you can observe and monitor and charge for. You can observe and monitor the good faith, the honesty of a lot of the intermediaries. So, so why not come back to your first solution, the, the one that you yourself used to, to put together private pools, which is to say risk retention, and figure out who's got to hold on to risk, and use that as the basis for uh, um, resuscitation of the private market. We've entered the Q&A portion of the conversation, so I'm going to give Bill a quick chance to respond, then, uh, okay. then we'll open up there. Let me, let me just say how I got the Russian transaction done, uh, because I think it's a, it's a data point, at least. The subordination structure was completely different than American subordination. In the US subordination, there's the senior, the, the AAA, and then under it are the various slices of credit enhancement. Those credit enhancements pay down as the collateral pay down, pays down. They have different rules for different types of collateral, but basically the subordination is not at the back of the transaction. So you as a subordinate holder are not only getting interest, but you're getting some principal flows off the pool. The way I did it with the Russian transaction was that the first loss piece was an accrual bond that was held by the bank. They got neither principal nor interest until everybody else was paid off. So their interest compounds and is accrues and is added to their principal. What that does is it economically takes the entire back end of the transaction and they own it. Then in front of them was a mezzanine bond, which I personally purchased. So when I was sitting down with you or you or you <coughs> saying I want you to put up X millions of dollars, I had my money in a position in front of yours in the credit stack so that I got shot before you got shot. So, <coughs> That is just a factual thing that adds an enormous amount of credibility to the transaction. So it was not only the originator who originated the loans under my supervision and according to my origination standards. And we had guys in their office while they were originating loans because they had never originated loans before. We set up the servicing protocol and then I put my money up in the mezzanine piece. 
then there was the senior piece, and they were stacked sequentially, not um, in any sort of pro rata manner. So the subordination structure was different, and it, it was purely to add credibility. So when I, I go to Washington and they start poking skin in the game, it's not only skin in the game at time zero, the skin can't come out of the game at time one or time two. And the skin in the game has to be in order of who controls the transaction. So the servicer and the originator have to be the last guy to get paid. The guy who put the deal together, which was me, who brought in the servicer and the investors, has to rely on the originator for good behavior, and then the senior investors have to rely on me and my <coughs> money being there for good behavior. And it worked. The, as a, the, the last subordinate bond I have over there should be paid off in, I think, February, March of next year. All right, well, thank you. Thank you guys very much. I'm gonna add one or two quick comments that we're gonna open up. I'll add two other data points. The first is Denmark, which has all of the attributes um, that Bill talked about, including a national recording system and bonds that are traded on NASDAQ. You can literally um, buy and sell um, Danish bonds with daily cash flows. And mortgage holders can actually buy their mortgage out of the bond based on rules that exist. So it's incredibly liquid and transparent. Um, Danish bonds in the crisis traded inside, Danish mortgage bonds traded inside of the Danish um, Danish sovereign bonds, almost unheard of for private bonds to trade inside of country bonds, but they were actually more liquid, the Danish mortgage bonds than the Danish sovereign bonds during the uh, financial crisis. The other example, of course, is U.S. credit cards, which look enormously like the structure that Bill talked about because they have a pay structure where the investor money gets paid out before the bank money and the banks originate and hold and service credit cards and the credit card market was liquid right up to um, September, October of 2008 and then two months later became liquid again. So there are other data points that are along those lines. So let's open up for a uh, question. Barrett, you've been, so give it quick and then um, uh, Ben, you're next. Uh, so my question is about due diligence and the standardization of due diligence and how helpful it would be in terms of opening the market up again. Uh, I just want some of the panelists' opinions first about Project Restart, uh, whether that is, uh, is a significant factor. And secondly, uh, so far the SEC has been shy about specifying what would be adequate due diligence. Some, something more than the general due diligence rule um, in uh, public offerings or uh, conditioning um, uh, exemption from uh, registration uh, on some kind of due diligence, standardized due diligence requirement, whether, whether that would be of help. Very quickly, anyone? I can quickly comment on that, but uh, some of the methods we use in the paper, they could be used by investors and rating agencies. So the amount of information available now is much more than what was in 2007. Of course, you always worry that people find some other ways to circumvent the system. But these things can be essentially nowadays used with a real time, in a real time. So I think that would be very helpful. And we talked with Security and Exchange Commission, and they are considering raising the standard of the disclosure requirement in the sense that this data that uh, underwriters give to investors will have a much more kind of a legal weight. But it's up to discussion. I don't know which way it will go. Great. Hi. Uh, my name is Kim Schaefer. I'm a proud graduate of Columbia Law School. I also work for the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission after having been a senior managing director in securitization at Bear Stearns. My question, and, and also before that, I worked for the Senate Banking Committee on Fire Rate. Um, <coughs> Why, in your view, has the SEC brought so few civil cases um, if you think the principal <coughs> best remedy is, is through a public means? And then secondly, I, I'm, as I look at cases and do some expert witness work, I'm surprised to see how many judges thr throw out cases saying that investors took this risk and they should have known better. Um, we're all big boys. 
uh, case closed when I believe in, indeed that there was concealed and inaccurate information that investors did not have access to. I, I think if the government has properly went after the banks, we would have all the major banks be insolvent. And one thing I will seem like a diversion or a digression, but if you look at the second lien portfolio, the top four banks have 450 billion of second liens on their books at approximately par when the first liens are collapsing. The only reason why those are on their books at par is they have the servicing rights on the first liens. And they're servicing those in a manner that is massively outside the servicing protocols. And they're hiding behind the 25% shield. Um, if they were to service those correctly, I think it's pretty obvious they would either be near insolvent or be insolvent, and that goes for all four banks. Um, that's not something that anybody I've spoken to in Washington really wants to deal with. And so you've got a too big to fail, too intertwined to fail, and I'm not sure how you can solve that without rendering some of them insolvent and there's no political will to do that. And, it, and, it, and that, the first and second lien issue permeates the discussions with the AGs. I mean, they had a 49th state settlement that wrote first liens down as part of this $25 billion settlement but left second liens alone, which was not a penalty to the banks it was effectively a recapitalization of their second liens. Because if you write the first lien down and don't touch the second lien, the second lien is, is a much better asset. So the government's response to this has not only been not to prosecute these guys and not to go after them, but to use law enforcement to actually prop them up. And I think the real fact of the matter is, is the problem is too big for the government to handle directly, and they're trying to paper it over and make it go away. Go ahead. Just, um, you know, in terms of cases and the, and the success of cases, I mean, I think one big issue, and I alluded to this in my comments, is the plaintiffs, for 10b5 purposes, have the burden of establishing loss causation. That is, the misrepresentation, uh, even assuming that it happened, and we got some data on that, uh, cause the economic losses rather than the world blowing up. And I think that's, that's been a very difficult burden. Now, I will, uh, you know, the Supreme Court, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, has been very helpful on this recently. So they had the opinion saying for class certification purposes, you don't really need to show much on materiality and uh, defense can't challenge uh, the plaintiffs on loss causation for class cert. So some of the recent changes or recent decisions on class certification to help alleviate this burden that the, the plaintiffs have, but I certainly think that's been an issue. Okay, well, we have uh, run over a little bit. I appreciate uh, appreciate your uh, patience. We still have uh, plenty of time for networking and uh, and coffee and restroom at this hour. So it's about uh, twenty to eleven. We will uh, we will be back here at eleven o'clock to um, talk about a second large issue of potential misrepresentation, which is LIBOR. Um, and very much the global uh, the global perspective on this. So uh, have a nice break. And I wanted to thank our panelists. <laughs>